You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, a rapid analysis of the North American heat wave finds climate change did play a part. We hear how the United States will need to adapt to the new normal. How the world's most climate vulnerable countries aim to tackle the crisis and promote economic growth. And from seagrass to kelp forests, we find out more about the projects using nature to help protect the planet. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those coming up with the solutions. And we're going to start today at our data dashboard and the numbers that are affecting our planet right now. And let's show you this number. It's an estimate of just how much hotter the Earth is compared with pre-industrial levels. And at the moment, we're just over 1.2 degrees of warming. Now, that increase means record temperatures and extreme weather events are becoming more common. Well, last month was the hottest June ever in North America. And today, new analysis should suggest the record high temperatures would have been virtually impossible without climate change. A rapid analysis of the heat wave by an international team of climate scientists found global warming driven by human activity made it at least 150 times more likely to happen. So let's remind you of some of the numbers. And before last week's heat wave in the north, we were already seeing extreme heat and drought in states in the southwest of the US. Now, Phoenix in Arizona hit a record of 46 degrees for five consecutive days in June. While in California, Palm Springs tied with its all-time temperature record of just over 50 degrees. Then last week in Oregon, the city of Portland reached a record of 46.6 degrees. Now, the average temperature for that time of year would normally see highs of around 26. Seattle in the state of Washington set a new record with a high of more than 42 degrees Celsius. While the all-time Canadian record was broken with Lytton in British Columbia recording a temperature of nearly 50 degrees, well above the country's previous national record of 45 degrees Celsius. Well, our US correspondent Greg Milam is in Los Angeles for us now. And Greg, are these record high temperatures affecting attitudes towards climate change? Yeah, I think they are. The fact that, that these were so unusual, the fact that they were so much hotter than the previous records, so much hotter than people had actually predicted is forcing people to take more notice. And, and what the researchers are looking at is whether there's a bigger shift uh, than they thought in unexpected places, so like the Pacific Northwest and those, those numbers you mentioned there. Because they say, until now, a heat wave like this has been considered something like a one in a 1,000 year event. But with current trends, they say, by the 2040s, it could be a, an event that happens every five to 10 years. And that's why they're sounding these, these warnings. And scientists who involved in this research say the message from it is very clear. The most important thing we need to do is stop burning fossil fuels um, as fast as possible. Um, because as long as we emit um, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the atmosphere gets warmer. And so these dramatic heat waves become even more intense and more likely. But we also need to be better prepared. We need to change how our cities are designed. Because if you have lots of green spaces in the city, the temperatures don't get quite as hot. And, and so that, that's a very important adaptation measure that we also need to take. Because heat waves are how climate change manifests today. So that's on governments, of course. Uh, the Biden administration has been talking about climate again today. They have a very different approach, as we know, from, from his predecessor in the White House. And they say the focus should be on heat-related deaths. They estimate hundreds, possibly thousands of people died as a result of that heat wave we've just seen. Uh, heat is the, the biggest weather-related killer in the US, more than wildfires, more than hurricanes. And they say that's something we need to focus on because there is another heat wave coming in the next few days, not as extreme, but they say it's something we're going to have to get used to. Greg, thank you. In today's other climate news, a court has declared the Australian government must protect young people from harmful carbon dioxide emissions if a new coal mine is approved. A judge found the country's environment minister, Susan Lay, must take reasonable care to avoid causing personal injury or death to Australian residents under the age of 18. 
climate has changed the size of our bodies, according to new research. The University of Cambridge study analysed 300 fossils and found colder climates drive the evolution of larger bodies, while warmer climates lead to smaller bodies. It suggests that as global warming brings higher temperatures, humans could evolve to become smaller to adapt. And people are finding themselves in increasing conflict with wild animals. The World Wildlife Fund says the rising demand for space, aggravated by climate change and habitat loss, means more species are being forced to cohabit with humans. It's led to animals like elephants and cheetahs being killed in self-defence or to protect livestock, which puts them at risk of extinction. Getting countries to work together to tackle climate change is an essential part of addressing the climate crisis. Today, Bangladesh hosted this year's V20 Finance Summit, bringing together governments with the aim of transforming economic activities while keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees and also allowing growth in the world economy. Well, joining me now from Dakar is Abul Kalam Azad, special envoy of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. Uh, welcome to you. Uh, so what have you been calling for at this V20 summit? The main agenda for this summit is recovery for the sustainable prosperity and also innovative financing for the climate prosperity. Uh, call on by the Honorable Prime Minister by putting a climate prosperity plan uh, for Bangladesh, uh, which we call the Mozib Climate Prosperity Plan. And this will act as template for all the CBF country where she called for having a climate prosperity plan in all the CBF countries. And how important is assistance from the rest of the world? Back in 2009, a promise was made that $100 billion a year would be given to developing countries to help them tackle climate change. That pledge still hasn't been met and it's overdue. How much faith do you have that, that help will come? This $100 billion per year uh, Paris Agreement, it is not fulfilled again. So now from this summit, we are raising our voice that uh, in next five years, 500 billion, who is going to contribute how much? Where you are going to put this money? Please come up with a specific program for these vulnerable countries. So we want to raise this voice from now and we want to take this to the COP26 also. Well, Abul Kalam Azad, it's good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Now, I'm sure everyone was glued to the climate show last night, but apparently there was also a football match on as well. And as the nation stopped to watch England beat Denmark, it had an impact on how much power we were using. Now, here you can see the demand on a normal Thursday evening there in yellow, and then the demand on the grid last night. Now, electricity usage was actually lower than usual because everyone stopped doing all their normal energy intensive activities and focused on the game. But, however, there were three spikes in demand that you can see there. They're all lining up with breaks during the match. Now, at half time, there was a pickup in demand of 1,400 megawatts. Now, that's the equivalent of boiling 777,777 kettles. And there were also peaks at full time and at the end of extra time as well. Now, last night, 44% of electricity generated came from fossil fuels and 16% from renewable sources. And that figure was low because of calm wind and also because the match was on in the evening, there was less solar generation. And you can see a full breakdown of where electricity in Great Britain is coming from at any time you like. Just head to skynews.com slash climate. Now, small changes can make a big difference to our environment, and it's hoped that 12 new high-impact nature-based solutions will help tackle the climate crisis. Now, the projects include restoring thousands of hectares of peatlands in northern England. Peat is an amazing way to store carbon naturally, saving more than 8,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide per hectare every year. A project by Essex Wildlife Trust to restore and protect the UK's salt marshes will be expanded. Now, they act as a massive carbon sink, as well as reducing flood risks and the effects of storm surges. 
And seagrass can capture carbon up to 35 times faster than tropical rainforests. But 90% of UK seagrass meadows have been lost. And it's hoped that a project in the Solent will help restore them and improve biodiversity in the process. Well, Dr Tim Ferrero is a senior marine biologist at the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust, who are responsible for that project. He joins me now. Uh, Dr Ferrero, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing there then. Hello, Anna. Yes, well, we're very lucky down here on the south coast in the Solent to have some of the best and most important remaining seagrass meadows in the country. And we know in the Solent from anecdotal records that we too have lost a tremendous amount of seagrass over the last hundred years. And seagrass does have this amazing ability to capture carbon and tremendous other ecosystem benefits as well. And so our project, which is the Solent Seagrass Restoration Project, which we're doing actually in partnership with Boscalis Westminster and supported by the People's Postcode Lottery, we are looking at ways that we can actually give nature a help and help to restore some of our lost seagrass. So it has an important function in capturing carbon, but also what can it do locally to the habitat? Well, yes, as, as a carbon capture, obviously it's a plant. It takes in carbon dioxide into its leaves and roots and stores that. But a really important feature of seagrass is its habitat function. So as seagrass goes through a seagrass meadow, you can see one behind me here uncovered by the tides, it slows down the seawater and lots of particles and organic material drop out and they sink down into the sediment and are buried. That's a really important part of the carbon capture function of a, of a seagrass meadow. But also it does things like purify water and that process of, of slowing down currents absorbs wave energy. So seagrasses amazingly have, have a, an impact on our coastal protection. Dr Tim Ferrero, thanks very much indeed. You're welcome. Well, that's everything from us for today. Tomorrow, find out more about the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for teenagers to explore Antarctica. Thanks for watching and see you then.